Hello again, and welcome back to another quarantine conversation. I'm Tim Merrick with the CDGA, and today we're joined by Rick Jacobson, golf course architect and founder of J Jacobson Golf Course Design. Rick, uh, appreciate you joining us this morning. Well, thanks for having me, Tim, and uh, happy Earth Day to everyone. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Um, let's just start off here. You know, you've been working with the design and construction of golf courses for a few decades now, uh, including the company you founded, as I just mentioned, Jacobson Golf Course Design for the last 19 years. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you kind of got started in that landscape, golf landscape and architecture industry and how it's kind of led you to where you're at now. Well, if you really want to get back to the, uh, the earliest days, um, when I was about eight years old, we would set up uh, golf courses in our neighborhood. We would cut holes in the yards and put coffee cans and play like the driveways were water hazards and we would play from yard to yard and hit little plastic golf balls. So that, it's uh, uh, the earliest stages, I guess, was uh, uh, when it started some golf course architecture work. But in all seriousness, um, it was in, uh, uh, at the University of Wisconsin, it was in landscape architecture program, worked for the Madison Park Planning Department for a semester. And the gentleman that was running the program uh, kind of dabbled in uh, golf course architecture. So that was my first uh, somewhat professional exposure to it. Um, but then um, when I, did, I was practicing landscape architecture with a firm, and this was in the 1980, which was a recession period. And there were um, situations where uh, layoffs were um, in the forefront of uh, the near future. And uh, since I was the last one hired, I thought, well, I might be the first one that um, um, is released here. So I need to start looking around. And what happened was that summer we had played at a uh, American Society of Landscape Architects golf outing at Kemper Lakes. And uh, the reception afterwards was at the Killing and Nugent office. And I kind of looked around there and thought that, you know, maybe that would be a good application to pursue. Um, so when the, with the layoffs in the, in the near horizon with the firm I was at, I really started to pursue opportunities in, in the golf course architecture field. I was fortunate enough to get a position with uh, Packard, um, Larry and Roger Packard in LaGrange in conjunction with working with the Wadsworth Company. So the arrangement was to work on the plans at the Packard office it was for a project in Dallas, Texas. And then while it was being built, go down there and, and work on the construction of the project. So I got a tremendous introduction to the industry um, at the onset with going through the planning design phase and then the actual implementation. Um, and then from that point, um, several years later, um, an opportunity with the uh, Nicholas organization. And um, so it, it was a, a, a process um, that started in at early ages and uh, continues on to today. Absolutely. Um, you know, you just briefly touched on there working with the, uh, the Jack Nicholas Golf Services as an assistant designer back in the 80s. What was it like kind of working with Nicholas, a legend, both just not only playing golf, but from some of his signature designs? And kind of what did you learn from working with uh, with him and alongside him? Well, yeah, Jack was, um, he was my childhood hero uh, growing up in the golf arena. You know, being from Chicago, of, of course, I wanted to be the next Ernie Banks or Bobby Hall or Dale Sayers. But uh, Jack was, was the one in golf. And um, it, it was such an honor to have an opportunity to, to work for him. Um, when I was at Packard Incorporated, um, I learned a lot about um, planned production and really fundamental uh, details of, of golf course design. When I went to work for Jack, it was up to like a master's or doctorate level of um, understanding design and how it applies to golfers and golfers of that caliber, um, the types of shots that are required. Um, tee shots, approach shots, shots around the green. Um, there was, I recall my first site visit with Jack on a construction site was in Atlanta at Country Club of the South. 
And we were looking at this particular hole and the green was set up on a left to right axis to play a fade shot into that green. Um, however, the fairway was all tilted from right to left. So the ball was above your feet. And when he looked at, at the, uh, the way it was setting up, you were asking a golfer to hit a fade with the ball above your feet, which is obviously a, a draw lie. And so some massaging of that fairway uh, tee shot landing area had to be done to accommodate that type of shot. So, you know, those types of details, they're very finite details that golfers as they're playing a round of golf don't realize that level of thought process goes into the design of a golf course. And I think that's what um, was very prevalent in my experience with Jack and, and learning how you know, pin placement locations and the shots played to access those locations. Um, those are the types of things that um, really played out in my experience in, in golf course designing with the Nicholas organization. Absolutely, you know, it sounds like an invaluable education that I think many of us would, would only dream of kind of hearing his thoughts and as well as your thoughts on things like that. Um, you know, we, we discussed briefly before we got on here just kind of about the, the current situation the world's going through. Um, what are some of the projects that you've been working on and kind of how have those been affected or how, how has the workflow of those projects been affected by this pandemic? Well, I would say, um, you know, it is challenging as it is for everyone um, working remotely, going through some of the um, permitting processes and getting the documents to the particular agencies, getting the reviews back to keep the process moving since that's a very you know, important step in uh, seeing a project through to its fruition and doing the construction implementation. So uh, that's, that would be one item. Um, a lot of our planned production is done somewhat remotely anyway. I'm you know, working with CAD operators to develop the AutoCAD uh, plans and um, things of that nature. So that hasn't changed a lot. I would say the uh, construction element is um, challenging in, in some respects. Um, if you're working with a national golf course contractor, they've got to bring people in from other parts of the country and house them. And that's an issue they're running into is, you know, finding hotel rooms to house the, the, uh, the workers. Um, as far as the supply chain, for materials, that doesn't seem to be an issue at this particular time. And um, construction is considered an essential business. So um, that's not an issue either. So it, it's more some of the, um, the logistics involved in, in executing the project. Um, we had one that was just um, delayed last week that was supposed to start here in Wisconsin. We've got two projects in the Chicago area that are moving forward and a couple others in the planning stages, and, and those really haven't um, changed schedule-wise. So yes, there are um, some impacts. Um, however, people are finding creative ways to work around them at this point in time. For sure, obviously, everybody, I think, has is, is kind of grown accustomed to this new normal, so to speak, within the last month. Um, you know, as a golf course designer and an architect, I'm sure this is a long-winded question here, but um, what kind of does, does the process look like for planning and executing a design? Um, and how does that kind of vary, if, if at all, from a renovation standpoint? Well, <laughs> the first step is uh, the golf course architecture is a business. I, I think it's romanticized by a lot of people um, that you just uh, sit and dream up golf holes all day long. But, you know, it really starts with of sales and marketing and public relations effort to get your name out there, establish a business, and and then you know win the proposal, the design or competition or whatever is set before you to attain that work. So that's really the first step is is getting the work um, and getting that uh, design agreement to move forward with a project. Um, then it's a step-by-step -step process. Uh, the first step is uh, the site analysis. 
and whether it's a raw site for new construction and, and reviewing the topography, the hydrology, the vegetation, any of the uh, governing agency requirements with uh, wetlands or um, um, archaeological uh, locations, you know, putting all of, all of those together on a base so that you understand the site and where the sensitive areas are and, and then being able to use that as a basis to move forward with your golf course routing and the golf course design. Um, from the renovation standpoint, it's more looking at the existing golf course features um, and, and what you know, are some of the goals and objectives of the club with the course that they have today and what they envision it being um, post renovation, you know, and where they want to position that facility. So once you've done the site analysis, then it gets into more of the preliminary design, design development phases. And, you know, on a raw site, you're, you're working with a, a blank canvas. So you've got a lot of different options available. When you're working on a renovation project, depending on the level of renovation, it, it could be a restoration of a historical old classical design, or it could be a, a renovation work that requires a redesign to upgrade that facility. So um, it, it's taking those um, different angles of approach and, and preliminary design, whether it's renovation or uh, new course design. And, and both projects are, are based again on the goals and objectives of your client and the clientele that he serves, whether it's a private club or a public club um, and you really want to be responsive to the goals and objectives in order to be successful and once the preliminary design is completed you go into construction documents and those are the detailed design documents that are used um, for the contractors to bid the project and eventually uh, construct the project from um, once those are completed, you go into the uh, bidding and negotiation phase where contractors put bids in for the work. Um, those are evaluated. Um, the backgrounds of all the contractors are evaluated uh, to determine you know, who provides the best, uh, not only the best price, but the best quality finished product. And that combination uh, you know, re results in value for the client. So, those are the types of contractors that we, we look for. And then uh, the last phase is the contract administration. And that's actually when uh, we get on site and work hand in hand with the contractors and make those subtle adjustments to, to make the project really fit seamlessly with, um, you know, whether it's a new course fits seamlessly with the existing environment, or if it's an existing course fit into the, context of the existing golf course. So that, that's kind of from start to finish in a nutshell, what, what the process looks like. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of stages and I'm sure you could go into the more in intricacies of those um, on a more minute level. Um, but, you know, you kind of touched on your work with, with Jack Nicholas um, in terms of the renovations, maybe some historical documents. Um, throughout your career, are there any kind of architects or, you know, people that have uh, designed or you know, put golf courses together, either past or present, that you've kind of taken philosophies or ideals from or that you look to as icons of the industry, so to speak? Well, you know, the old um, historical, classical, golden era architects certainly paved the way. And, you know, there's some amazing designs that were done and there's some things that were not done very well. So, you know, you take like the Alistair McKenzie and Donald Ross, Cole Allison, Tillinghast, um, and you take the things that they did well and you use those parts of design as inspirational elements in your design. Um, like Alistair McKenzie, you know, his ideal hole is to provide the greatest amount of pleasure for the greatest number of golfers. And that's a philosophy that I think every golf course architect need, needs to apply, particularly in today's day and age when we're in a competitive field, um, um, you know, trying to get more golfers involved in the game and, and use their discretionary um, income on, on, on getting involved in the game. And, you know, it's a sport of a lifetime and, 
um, you know, so using that architectural context to um, to grow the game. But um, yeah, so it's it's using some of the elements, um, you know, that Donald Ross and Tilling has their strategic risk reward approach to uh, golf course architecture and uh, uh, Mackenzie and Cypress Point, you know, my favorite course in the U.S., um, you know, just fitting a course into a natural setting and blending seamlessly with the surrounds. Um, you know, that's a, another foundational design concept to apply to every project. Absolutely. Um, you know, it seems like, you know, there's a lot of philosophies out there and, and, and at this point in the game, it's, it's kind of blending those into kind of what works best for you. And I've read on, on a couple of your, your website and things of that nature that um, when it comes to designing a course, you kind of look to make it aesthetically pleasing, playable, yet challenging. Um, if you could just go in a little more detail about kind of your philosophy when designing a golf course, as well as how that might vary when uh, a renovation comes about. Yeah, so, uh, you know, our, our basic um, philosophy is to exploit the dynamic relationship between the game of golf and the land on which it is played. And when you think about it, all the other sports, um, whether it's football or baseball, they all have dimensional fields of play. And golf is the one sport where every field is, is different. Every site that we work with is different. And it's really making sure that that golf course relates to that site that you're, you're working on. And, and again, whether it's a new course development or a renovation project applying that same principle. Um, we do have foundational elements that we apply to every project. Uh, things like, you know, when you're on the, the tee, making sure that that tee shot landing area is visible, the hazards guarding that landing area are visible. And um, I guess that comes from um, my experience working with the Nicholas organization and, and Jack. And I remember one site visit, he explained when he steps up on the tee, he looks at where the pin is on the green, not to directly at the tee shot landing area. He looks at where the pin is on the green first to, to decide what angle of approach would be most beneficial. And that sets his tee shot up then. So he works backwards from the hole, not from the tee to the green, but green to tee. So that's kind of a, um, you know, one of our foundational elements is the visibility of, of hazards and um, using a strategic design philosophy with risk reward opportunities. I think those options uh, create a lot of excitement and variation, and um, that provides a much more pleasing golf experience overall. So those types of foundational components we apply to every project, and then we let the site Kind of dictate the vernacular landscape that we're working in dictate you know how we set the golf course up as a visual character and the aesthetic of it and try to identify um, you know is there a, a unique approach or a creative design solution that we could implement that would um, uh, differentiate this project from other projects and, and give our client a, a you know, beneficial advantage in the, the marketing respects. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's working with a foundational philosophy and then applying that to each unique uh, site that we work with. Absolutely. Um, you know, you talked about recently, um, or earlier in this interview, you talked about working um, on some projects in the Chicago area at, at the moment. Um, you designed and worked on other courses in the area um, with work on courses like Bowes Creek, Glenview Park, Sunset Ridge, Sunset Valley, just to name a few in the area. What is it about this area of the country and the world uh, that keeps you working here and, and working on golf courses and then within the golf landscape uh, in this area? Well, for me, it's come full circle. Um, you know, I, I, I took it from the um, the yard golf that I spoke of when I was an eight year old to uh, when I believe I was 10 years old when I got my first golf token with the Glenview Park District for um, an annual um, uh, golf membership. 
I believe it was $35 and you could play as much as you want except Saturdays and Sundays. So I would throw my bag over my shoulder, ride my bike over and, and play until I had blisters on my hands. But, um, you know, so that was my early in introduction to golf. And then I had the opportunity to do the master plan, implement the master plan at that golf course. Um, I caddied at North Shore Country Club in Glenview. And I've had the tremendous opportunity to work with them for over 20, I think it's been 25 years now. So after traveling the world and now being able to come back and give back to the community, um, you know, there's a lot of personal gratification, um, just a sign of appreciation for the experience I've been given and then to bring that back and be able to apply it locally, uh, both in the Chicago area and the Midwest and um, back in the U.S. The commute's a lot better here <laughs> working in the Midwest than going over to uh, Asia and the 15-hour flights and yeah. you know, the 13-hour uh, time changes. <laughs> right. Right. Um, you know, you just touched on working with North Shore, and I'm sure that's a, been a memorable experience for you. And um, you touched on a lot of the designs and works of, of courses in the area. And I'm sure this is a question um, very similar to, you know, asking you to pick your favorite child. But if there's any courses or, or you know, designs in the area that you would kind of say are memorable to you, um, or uh, I don't want to say favorite, but um, some that kind of some that kind of stick out in your mind as as memorable or special to you. What would those designs or layouts be? Well, they're like, like you said, they're they're all all special. Actually, um, you know, just being presented with an opportunity to 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 do the work for a client that has uh, given you his um, you know the respect and just to be a part of a, a project team. You know, us architects get a lot of the um, the recognition, but I'll tell you what, it, it takes um, a team effort from A to Z. Um, you know, the contractors implementing it, uh, the owner with a unbelievable vision and the financial wherewithal to carry it out, a superintendent to maintain the course at a level um, that provides a quality level of play and and then the operations to be welcoming to the golfers and and really provide an experience that golfers would want to come back again. So that's been uh, such a great experience um, with each and every project. Um, I would say there's a few of them that I'll mention that not that they're favorites, but because there are such unique uh, projects um, that people may not understand that you encounter uh, these types of situations and one was in China and you know I had never met a site that I didn't love because you can always come up with a creative design solution to resolve issues but this site was intimidating it was these big domes of rock the valleys had chicken farms and cashew plantations and I went on that site and I I was like, how am I going to put a golf course on this property? And as we went from the different parts of the site, um, we went on these little roads and they were cut into the rock. And the rock um, that was exposed was a red color. I was like, this looks like a Sedona type setting. If people are aware of what Sedona, Arizona looks like, beautiful. Uh, red rock outcroppings and I was like that's the answer we're gonna cut into these rock formations create this beautiful aesthetic use that material to fill the valleys to give us the width to fit the golf holes and it's been a great um, project they host the uh, a China LPGA event um, so, so that was one and that was just because of the, the uniqueness of the site um, along with, um, there was one out east called Bear Trap Dunes in Delaware, and we, they didn't have property Oceanside, but it was certainly, it's an Oceanside type community. And what happened was when we first went on site and did our site analysis, we did, um, it was a perfectly flat site, very few trees at all. Um, 
it, you know, there was, wasn't not a lot of uh, positive physical attributes of the site until we took a backhoe and dug um, some soil samples and found this deep layer of white sand. So we decided to take that sand and create the dunescape that you would see along the ocean. And then we used the, uh, their Department of Natural Resources uh, dune restoration uh, plant material is our plant palette to plant the dunes. So we just, instead of having the, um, um, the oceanfront property, we brought the oceanfront to our site. Um, one last project was um, um, right here in Chicago, and it was the um, the Glenview Park District was the um, uh, the Prairie Club, uh, formerly known as the Glenview National Nine. So, growing up in Glenview, close to the Naval Air Station, we our shelves used to rattle when the jets would take off. So, you know, here we are taking up a, a piece of property that was as flat as a pool table. It's airplane hangars and runways, and we turn it into a golf facility that is a recreational amenity for the community. And I, I just thought that that was such an interesting transformation and reuse of a property, you know, to provide green space and um, recreation for the community it was a, a just a tremendous transformation. So those are just a few of the kind of unique projects that. Um, uh, we've done over the years. Yeah, and you just mentioned there that you've, you know, working in China and in other countries, you've traveled the world and, and the country um, working on projects and seeing different landscapes and different designs. Um, I'm curious, um, you mentioned Cypress Point earlier. Uh, maybe you could go in a little more detail as to kind of why you see that as uh, an admirable design and maybe if there are any other courses that people would know that you kind of look to to say, you know, that's something that I, I like or admire from a layout or a design perspective. Yeah, so uh, Cypress Point, um, everybody sees Pebble Beach. Um, the tournament's out there, just the unbelievable setting. And that is a fantastic golf course. The ocean holes are just so memorable. And, you know, the strategy that's incorporated into them is, is wonderful as well. Um, you get that same thing out at Cypress Point, but what Cypress Point has um, is the, the, the golf holes that are internal, inland, are, they don't have the aesthetic, dramatic impact as the ocean holes do, but they have every bit of the strategic um, uh, impact and uh, the tremendous design and the the bunkering that McKenzie does with fitting it in to make it look natural. And um, it's just, it, it's, it's, it's hard to explain in words, but when you walk down those fairways, it, there's a feeling that you get that this place is something special. And, and that's what I, I get there. Um, you know, there are other courses that, um, you know, you, you look at Pinehurst and Donald Ross and, some of the unbelievable uh, design that he did there. I remember Jack saying that you could cut every tree down at Pinehurst and you would still have a great golf course because the design is, is just that good. So um, yeah, that's, those are kind of my, my thoughts about uh, Cypress Point and, and why that's special. Um, you know, a, a couple others, um, Royal County Down over in Northern Ireland, is another unbelievable giant dunes. And they, you know, back then they didn't have the heavy earth moving equipment. So they really had to make the holes fit the land. And that's, again, that setting is just so dramatic. Um, Royal Dornock in Scotland is another one of my favorites. And you know, that's again, where Donna Ross kind of grew his game and was the head pro and um, just another classic design, you know, every hole is different. There's unique types of shots that are required by golfers on, on every hole. So it's, you know, that again is, just goes towards the, uh, the golf experience and the overall uh, combination of the golf and the aesthetics that you're surrounded by um, are just um, overwhelmingly beautiful. And 
experiential. Well, Rick, uh, we appreciate you joining us this morning and taking some time today to kind of give us some insights, not only on, on your designs and kind of your philosophies, but kind of some, as we just touched on, the, the, your thoughts on other uh, courses and designs on the world. Um, enjoy the conversation and you know, hope that you and your family are staying safe and healthy during this time. Thank you. You as well, Tim, and, and everyone in the CDGA and the Chicago area, be safe, stay healthy.